epistles uh, because they're not written to a specific church. They're not written necessarily to a specific person, uh, but it's written to Christians in general uh, to encourage them in their faith and guide them in the way that they should you know, live out their faith. And so uh, James is considered a general epistle. Uh, the theme of the book um, is um, uh, faith that works or uh, spiritual maturity. Uh, it's the idea that, uh, you know, like I said, during a couple of the different uh, studies, uh, it's time to get serious about our faith. And I think that's something that uh, James would have related to or kind of what he relates. Uh, the purpose of his writing uh, is to encourage the believers uh, during difficult times uh, and to instruct them in practical Christian living. Understand that when this is happening, when he's writing this, the Jews are persecuting uh, the, the, the Christian church just in general. Uh, the Romans are starting to pick up some steam on the same thing where they're beginning to persecute the church as well. And so he's writing to believers much like ourselves that are just starting to see, you know, uh, our nation turn in that corner in such a way that they don't view Christianity in a positive way. You know, that our culture and society now, uh, Christianity is the minority uh, in, in many respects. And uh, it'll, it'll grow more and more hostile, I believe. And so James is writing to a group of people that are living under those very conditions uh, and then learning how to live out their faith. And so... Uh, Again, uh, the purpose of that is just to instruct us in practical Christian living. Uh, he describes that Christianity isn't just a belief system or a philosophy, but that it is truly a way of life, uh, something to, to be believed in and acted on, uh, very practical. He doesn't get into a lot of deep theological stuff. He just gets into some real practical down-to-earth, where the rubber hits the road kind of uh, Christianity, which is something I can appreciate. Uh, Paul emphasized... Um, the grace of God and, and faith that leads to salvation, whereas James emphasizes the works that are a result of salvation, uh, not works leading to salvation, but the works that are a result of salvation. And so uh, according to James, if our faith doesn't result in works or action and it changed life, then it, he refers to it as a dead faith. And so sadly, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of people out there that are walking in a dead faith and they're not even realizing it, you know, that there needs to be some some kind of fruit that comes from that. Uh, the, I think the key verse uh, in this particular uh, letter is James chapter 1, verse 4, where he says, But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And, and again, that's the idea. Uh, he wants us to be perfect or complete or to be mature as Christians. Uh, you can be a, a Christian for 30 years and still, in a sense, be a baby Christian, or you can be a, a Christian for you know, six months and be a very mature Christian. It really depends on how we approach God's word and, and, and how we want to you know, dig in and draw near to the Lord. And so hopefully we'll be the, uh, the group that digs in and, and, and pursues that closer, deeper uh, relationship with him. Um, he addresses a lot of uh, uh, practical issues, which really boil down again to maturity. Uh, he writes to the 12 tribes that are scattered about. Uh, his letter went out to the Christian church, uh, church or to the Jews uh, and a lot of people don't realize that, that Christianity started out almost as a sect of Judaism. Uh, it was Jewish, you know, in its roots and, and, and its inception and early age. And, and then the Gentiles got into it and got a hold of it. And, uh, and it became a Gentile movement over time uh, with a Jewish minority. Uh, but it started out as a Jewish movement. And so uh, this letter is written to the Jewish believers that he refers to as uh, brothers in the flesh and brothers in the Lord. But with that, I'd like to just kind of start knocking out, uh, getting through the chapters here. Uh, in chapter 1, uh, we're exhorted to have patience uh, in trials. Uh, in verse 1, uh, James introduces himself as a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so James is the English transliteration uh, of the Hebrew name Jacob, or Yaakov, which means supplanter or, or, or cheater, uh, he introduces himself again as a bondservant or doulos, uh, a willing slave of Jesus. But then he, he puts it this way, uh, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he makes that statement that way, that connection, uh, basically he's saying uh, that uh, God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ are equal. Uh, this is just another one of those kind of areas where uh, the Bible declares that Jesus is God. And just as Jesus declared in John chapter 14, verse 9, when he said, He who has seen me has seen the Father. And so it's tantamount to that. Uh, in verse 2, he says, My brethren, you know, count it all joy 
we need to fall into various trials. And he uses that phrase throughout the book, my brethren. But then he says, count it all joy when uh, you fall into various trials, not if. Uh, people think that if you become a Christian, it's just going to be an easy life and a, you know, a, a, a bed of roses or a walk in a park or whatever. And James says, no, that's not how it's going to be. You know? And like I said many times, uh, we're told to follow Jesus, not necessarily to understand him. Uh, we're told that uh, uh, it may not be easy, but it will be worth it. And so uh, we just move forward uh, walking in his ways. Um, Paul tells Timothy in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, uh, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And so uh, that's just the part and parcel to uh, the faith that we've adopted. Uh, sometimes we think that God has forsaken us or he's angry with us, you know, when we fall into hard times or, or trials or difficulties. And it's like uh, some kind of curse from God or punishment or something like that. And that is not at all the case. God loves us so much. And so often he is doing a work in our hearts, in our lives, that we don't necessarily appreciate at the moment. You know, that honestly, I mean, he's doing a good work. Everything he does is good. We just don't always appreciate it because it's inconvenient. It's uh, painful. It's a lot of different things, but we know that God is good, that he loves us, his will is perfect, his word is true, and that we can really rejoice. We can count it all joy because, the, praise God, he's working on my life. You know, aren't you glad? You know, I, I'd rather have him working on my life and it's hurt, hurt, you know, it's painful or whatever than to be on the sidelines wondering, God, are you there? <laughs> you know, or anything like that. And so uh, we have to be able to accept that. Uh, Peter tells us in uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, Verses 6 and 7, he says, In this you greatly rejoice. It's not quite counted all joy, but it's pretty close. Uh, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to the praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. But again, Peter's saying the same thing that James is saying. You know, be glad, be happy, rejoice, count it all joy. Uh, that you're going through these things because God's doing it for a reason, for a purpose. And God does allow uh, our faith to be tested, uh, both that we might see where we really are and that our faith and our devotion might grow stronger in Him. Uh, I'm glad for those things at times because, uh, I mean, I'm not really glad always for the realization uh, when I realize how weak my faith is or I realize how, you know, I've I've got a, a uh, a, a, a better per, a spiritual perception of myself than the reality, you know, and, uh, and, and God lets me see, you know, where I'm really at at times. And it's like, okay, Lord, and, and, you know, it's a bummer at times, but it's okay, Lord, <laughs> I know where I am. <laughs> I know where to go, you know, I know what to repent of now and that kind of stuff. And so uh, God allows that so that we will grow, understand where we are and then grow stronger uh, in our walk. Uh, Peter again tells us in First Peter uh, chapter 4, verse 12, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing has happened to you. Uh, but rejoice uh, to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. And so, again, the rejoicing in it. Uh, in our times of trial, we always have the option of either drawing closer to God or pulling away from God. You know, and it's our choice that we exercise. Obviously, God, when, when, these, when these hard things happen, he wants us to turn into him. He wants us to, to draw close to him, to cling to him all the more. And, and, and I think that's part of the intent sometimes, you know, like this last week and a half, or, or, or the fires and stuff, is, or month, you know. Uh, <laughs> has anybody's prayer life improved besides mine? <laughs> you know, when you see the fire coming over the ridge, it's all of a sudden you're, you're praying hard. You know, when you, when you can't see across the street, or you hear about people getting evacuated or you're put on stand by yourself, all of a sudden our prayer lives have, you know, have, have improved quite a bit, actually. You know? and it, but God allows those things into our lives. That's one of the, the benefits, how he uses all things for good. And so, same thing. You know, we're told later on in James uh, chapter 4, verse 8, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. And so all, all these things that we've been going through have been really just uh, an opportunity for that. And to count it all joy, because God is doing a good work. He is growing our faith and strengthening us in the Spirit, because He does use these things for good in our lives. Just like, like Paul says in Romans 8, 28. You know, and we know that all things work together for good. 
to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And so, you know, we may not always be able to put our finger on it, like, God, I'm not sure how this is going to be good, but by faith, you know, I trust you're doing some good thing. And so we, we let him do that good work in us. We can kick and scream all we want, but uh, it goes a lot better if you just, you know, be still and know that he is God. You know, let him do that. Uh, also in verse 5, we're spending more time in chapter 1. We're going to go a little faster than the rest of them. Uh, but chapter 1 just got so many awesome points in it, uh, I couldn't breeze through it too easy. But in verse 5, he says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given him. And, and I love that, that God gives wisdom. And you know, basically all wisdom comes from him, but the cool part is that it's ours for the asking. You know, we don't have to sit uh, in ignorance. We don't have to sit, you know, feeling like we're abandoned or whatever, or, or, or that we're hopeless, but we can always ask him, and he gives it to us. And, and what I love is that he gives it to us, you know, in the form of his word. And so we've, we've got access to it. Uh, in Psalm 119, verse 130, it says, The entrance of your word gives light, and it gives understanding to the simple. And it's like, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord. You know, that he, that he blesses us with his word. But then we get to verse 8. I don't know I'm skipping down a little bit, but look at verse 8. It says, uh, it's an admonition against being, as it says here, a double-minded man uh, that is unstable in all of his ways. And, and the exhortation here is to not be double-minded. Um, what he's talking about there is that we, we would be, have an undivided heart and an undivided mind and, and, and that we would be wholly 100% committed in our relationship with him. A divided heart or a double-minded man is kind of like, well, I'm, he's part in the world and he's part in the spirit. You know, he's, he's like, you know, 85% Christian, 50%, you know, whatever. You know, I, I don't know how to break that down more than he's looking for 100% commitment. And if we're anything less than that, then there's some aspect of being double-minded when it comes to our relationship with him. And so he's looking for total commitment. You know, Jesus, when he was asked what the greatest commandment was in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind and, and with you know, all your strength, all your soul. And um, <clears throat> different gospels list all those different things. But, uh, but the word all is what st stands out. You know, all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. He didn't say like 95%. He said the whole thing. And as, as much as we may struggle with that at times, my prayer is, Lord, help me to have an undivided heart. Help me, Lord, to, to, to give you more and more and more of who I am and, 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 to, and less and less consideration to the world. Uh, in verse 16, he says, Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. And he repeat, you know, Jesus repeats that very thing in the New Testament several times, but there's obviously a need for discernment. He says, don't be deceived. That means people are going to try and deceive us. And um, I tell you what, it's, uh, it, it's hard. I, I get people sending me videos and uh, information and all kinds of stuff about all the different conspiracies out there and all the things that are going on and how it started back here and then and the other way. And it's like, you know, it's, it, it all, I'm, I'm, most, I'm the most gullible guy on the planet, I guess. I'm going, wow, that's really bad, you know. And, uh, but, I, you know but I take everything with a grain of salt because I know the only thing I can really believe in this whole wide world is God's word. You know, and, and everything I read, I have to compare it to that. That's my litmus. And so, you know, there's something, well, that, that could be really bad, you know, if it's, tr if it's true. <laughs> you know, and so again, you got to compare it to God's word. Uh, going down to verse 17, <coughs> it says that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. It comes down from our Father of lights, with whom there's no variation uh, nor shadow of turning. And, uh, and it just reminds me, where do all the good things in life come from? They come from our God. You know, it's, uh, it, it's not just because it's payday, because that comes from God. You know, it, it's not just because it's this or that. It, it's the, 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 an attitude of gratitude, you know, an attitude of thanksgiving, rightly directing, if you will, uh, our, our gratitude for what he's done for us. And so understanding where, the good, where it all comes from. Uh, verse 19 uh, so then, my beloved brethren, be, uh, uh, let every man be swift to hear, uh, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Uh, 
I would expound on that verse, but I'm just going to tell you that's good counsel. You know, uh, that's all you need to know. Just check that verse out. And then verse 22, uh, I think this is part of the meat of this chapter, is but be doers of the word and not hearers only, uh, deceiving yourselves. If you hear the word and, 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 and nod, you, you, you agree with it like, yeah, uh-huh. you assent to that intellectually. That's one thing. That's good. But don't let it stop there. It's got to move on to where we become a doer of that thing that we just agreed with. Otherwise, if we don't, we're just deceiving ourselves. You know, and, and we, we can be caught up in, because we agree with something in, in some respect in our heart and our mind, we think we've done it. And we've got to kind of check ourselves a little bit, say, well, am I doing this? Am I living my life this way? And, uh, and, and the Holy Spirit's really good <laughs> about, you know, revealing some of those things. And so um, as the Spirit speaks to your heart about that, uh, take heed to it. And then verse 27 uh, is the culmination of it, uh, where pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, uh, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. And again, this is just another practical demonstration or demonstrable faith, if you will, that you, know, you see people in need, like widows and orphans, that you do something. You know, that we take a practical kind of an action, whatever that might be, and, uh, you know, obviously pray for them, but maybe you say, hey, that person needs their yard mode, or, or maybe a bag of groceries on the front porch or a gift card or, or something uh, where you, you consider their situation a little bit and, uh, and, and take action based on how the Holy Spirit would prompt you to that. And so, again, uh, a, a practical demonstration of faith. Then as we move into chapter 2, uh, chapter 2 really describes uh, faith and works, or faith that works, you know, uh, actionable faith, you know. Uh, and so in the first 13 verses, actually, uh, interesting that instead of talking about charitable deeds and, you know, doing nice things and giving or whatever that, you know, we could talk about in terms of uh, actionable faith, the first thing he brings up is not showing partiality, you know, not being in a sense, kind of a, a hypocrite. Uh, but, you know, there's times when you like certain people because they're, they're cool looking and handsome and have nice clothes or, you know, uh, you know cool stuff. Or you, you, you don't like other people because they don't look so cool, they don't have such nice stuff or whatever. And, uh, or, you know, economic status or social status or whatever. And, uh, and he says, my brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. And, and so the idea is, uh, that we wouldn't be a respecter of persons or a respecter of, you know, wealth or whatever, you know, and, um, and not to show that kind of partiality because it will, it will injure our witness to others. And we want to be a good witness. Uh, skipping down to verse 10, it says, For whoever should keep the whole law and yet stumble one point, uh, he is guilty of all. And so the idea is that we can't just keep part of the law. And remember, he's talking to Jewish believers. They've, they've come away from the law. They've come away from all that stuff. And uh, they're trying to live their lives as Christians now. And, uh, but there's always going to be that temptation to tradition, uh, that temptation at times to justify yourself based on, quote, unquote, the law. And James is pointing out, hey, if you don't keep the whole law, you're guilty of the whole thing. You, know, you violate one point. Uh, and, you know, you can say, well, you know, uh, uh, I've been really good. I didn't, I didn't commit adultery, so I'm, I'm good. No, but if you lied or hated somebody or stole, you know, you violated the law. The wages of sin is death either way. It doesn't take it like, you know, how many horses you got to steal to be a horse thief? <laughs> Just one. <laughs> and so that's kind of what he's talking about here. Uh, you, you know, he's saying you can't pick and choose. Uh, interesting. I know this is uh, geared towards uh, Jews and, and whether they keep the whole law or none of the law, that kind of stuff. But I tell you what, and you guys know this, there's a lot of Christians out there that approach Christianity like it's a smorgasbord or a buffet or something. And it's like, a, you know, well, I like this kind, of like some of that, like that. And they pick and choose parts that they, you know, agree with or are comfortable or whatever. But I tell you what, it's a package deal, you know, and it's kind of like God's word. Uh, people have issues with like, the book of Genesis or they have issues with the book of Revelation. It's like, nah. It's a package deal. You know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, period. You know, if you can believe that, then the rest of the book's a breeze. But, uh, you know, we take the whole thing. 
And, and, and by the grace of God, by the way, he doesn't dump, dump the whole thing on you at one time. I mean, if you guys, like me, had kind of a progressive revelation through your life and through your walk, I mean, you're, 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 at first you learn a lot of things. You go, oh, man, i got to stop cussing, or oh, i got to stop doing this, or i got to stop doing that. You know, I need to start being nice to people, or you know, different things. And, and the Lord shows you, but he doesn't drop the whole thing on you at one time. I mean, I've been walking with the Lord for 35 or so years now, and I'm still learning a lot, and God is showing me things still that I, sometimes I, just, I learn stuff and go, why didn't I learn that 30 years ago? You know, why, why have I I've been so blind or so stubborn or whatever it is, you know? But God is gentle to, you know, kind of that progressive revelation in a sense to, to guide us. But when we know about something, then we're to be yielded to it, to let the Holy Spirit do that work in our hearts and our lives. And so, you know, it's a cool thing. Uh, in verses um, 14 through 20, it's kind of a, a the same topic. It's it's application. It's you know, action speaks and testifies to our faith that we don't just say we're believers, but we we demonstrate that by our actions. But I want to draw your attention to verse seventeen. Uh, it says, "Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead." And so our faith should manifest itself in some tangible ways. You know that that. If you're the same exact person, say you've been saved for like 20 years. If you're the same person today that you were 20 years ago, something's wrong, <laughs> okay? You know, when I became a Christian, my life began to change. I, the Lord, you know, took the, well, it was a process, but he, you know, he took violence and profanity and, and, and a number of things, you know, and, and anger issues. I still deal with anger issues, but he's you know, not like I did before, praise God. But I mean, it, it's a progressive thing where, People that have known me for any period of time go, well, you're not the same guy today that you were. I mean, I, I, that's why I moved so away from Long Beach so all the cops couldn't come up here and tell you what a bad guy I was. But, but, the, but if some of them came up here, and a few have, they go, man, you're different. And I go, praise God. <laughs> you know. But that's the whole point, is that our lives should change. We should be impacted by what we believe. <laughs> and real faith, genuine faith, leads to good works. Uh, th there must have been issues, I think, in the early church for James to even address this. You know, and, and even as James is addressing this, it kind of parallels a little bit uh, some of the things that Jesus addressed uh, during his earthly ministry. Uh, in Matthew's gospel, in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 and forward, he says, this is Jesus speaking, he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, <coughs> excuse me, so enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father, so there's, there's a call to action there. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, uh, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? And then I, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Uh, wherefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, uh, I will liken him to a wise man. So there's an emphasis there on you know doing the things that we're learning. But notice what Jesus said. There's some people who claim to be Christians, but it says they're uh, you who practice lawlessness. So they're, they're claiming to be Christians, but they're still living in a lawless manner. And, and, and they're self-deceived because they thought they were good and they found out at the wrong time, <laughs> you know, away from me, I never knew you. And so we want to be very careful that that's not us, that we're not looking in, you know, a, a primrose kind of a mirror and not seeing what's there, you know, that we see with clarity and, uh, and allow the Holy Spirit to guide us. You know, Jesus said in, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 16, he said, you will know them by their fruits. The, the fruit of our lives is very telling. Uh, and, and there was intended, I believe, to be a, a practicality to our faith. You know, warm wishes and happy thoughts aren't always going to cut it. You know, we have to be willing uh, to help people and to do things. Uh, even uh, the Apostle John jumps in on this in, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 18, when he says, My little children, uh, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And so, <clears throat> not just talking about stuff. Uh, looking at chapter 2, verse 23, uh, <clears throat> you read about Abraham here. It says, And the scripture was fulfilled where it says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. 
Now, the, the lead up to that is when Abraham took his son, his only begotten son, and was willing to actually, uh, <coughs> his, the son that he loved, uh, willing to sacrifice him just because God said so. And, you know, in his actions, he proved that he believed God. He trusted that God would raise him up from the dead. And, but his, his faith translated into action and where his, his faith was, in a sense, validated, I guess. And God accounted that to him as righteousness. And that's pretty cool stuff. And then verse 26, uh, for as the body without uh, the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Now, I would just say, you know, uh, I was dealing with somebody recently. <clears throat> they were literally dying uh, over at uh, Banner Hospital. I got to visit with him a little while before he passed away. And uh, he, he prayed to reaffirm his faith. You know, he, 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 he talked about his love for Jesus. Uh, and and he, he bemoaned kind of a life that was wasted, that he didn't have, you know, he didn't do the things he knew we should have done all along. And he goes, I, I don't think I'm saved because the Bible says that without, without works, your faith is dead. And I go, well, the thief on the cross couldn't do a whole lot either. You know, he was nailed there to the cross and he, he couldn't get baptized. He, he couldn't get out and, you know, go walk the old lady across the street. There's a bunch of stuff he couldn't do. But Jesus said, this day you'll be with me in paradise because Jesus, Jesus knew the man's heart. He knew what was in there and that his, his faith was genuine. And I would say the same thing. Jesus knows whether our faith is genuine or not. We're the ones that sometimes don't know. <laughs> and that's why, you know, and maybe others don't know at times. And I, I can't testify like, you know, I know a lot of believers. I can't say for sure that every single one of them is saved. Sometimes you see the, their works, you see the, the, the fruit of their lives. You go, yeah, it looks pretty good to me, you know. But God's the only one that really, really knows. And so this is a way that we can know as well when, uh, as it says here, uh, faith without works is dead. But that brings us now to chapter 3. And chapter 3 <clears throat> talks about uh, the unruly member, uh, basically our tongue. And um, I almost don't really, uh, you know, this chapter uh, is a hard chapter in a couple of ways because it challenges us to be careful with what we say. Anybody besides me ever get in trouble for something you said? <laughs> you know, that's, that's a weak point for every, every believer. And, and even the ones that are really quiet, you know, well, you, you probably don't have any problem with that. Well, why do you think I'm quiet, you knucklehead? Because I've, you know, <laughs> I've, I've, I've been burned. And, uh, and, but it starts off uh, in chapter 3, verse 1, with an admonition. Uh, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we should receive a stricter judgment. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I'm very conscious of, of that. Uh, I'm reminded of it often, actually. Uh, I want to be very careful what I teach. But the admonition here is that because you're being held to a, a higher standard, and, and we'll all give a, 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 an account of every word, every idle word, every intentional word or whatever, but it is that admonition that it's not a freebie. And so we've got to be careful. Um, Verses 2 through 12 uh, talk about the tongue being an unruly evil. Um, and, and the most difficult thing for us to bridle at times is either to take our thoughts captive or to make sure those thoughts don't escape out of our lips. <laughs> you know, to be careful about what we say. Uh, you know, it, it, it's true in my life. I hardly ever get in trouble for the things I don't say. Uh, but the things I do say seem to come back and get me uh, on a pretty frequent basis. But... <clears throat> the most difficult thing to bridle is the tongue, and, and that's our goal, that our speech and everything we say would be pleasing to God. Uh, I love what David wrote uh, and, and sang in Psalm 19, verse 14. Uh, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. You know, and <clears throat> Lord, and, and I've been amazed the times when uh, God's given me the foresight just to shut up. You know, you're in a conversation and there's like 12 things you could say. And you just say, you know, um, okay, well, you know, I'll think about that. And, and walk away not saying you know, either the smart alecky thing or the other thing we could say to refute something. And there's been times when people have said outright stupid things to me. And, uh, and it's like, you know, slow pitch. I'm a master of, you know, they, they pitch it nice and slow and I want to knock it out of the park. 
It's like, no, I'm, just, I'm not even going to swing on that one today. You know? And when I've walked away from those conversations, knowing that I, I kind of held back, I begin to praise God because that's not me. <laughs> you know? First thing I want to do is trip on my tongue. And, um, and so, Lord, help uh, the words of our mouths, the meditation of our hearts to be acceptable to you. He goes on in that passage to say that the lips that we use for blessing God shouldn't be used to curse men. You know, it, it's kind of taking something that's sanctified and using it for, you know, bad stuff. Uh, we really shouldn't do that. Uh, Paul tells us in Ephesians 4.29, uh, let no corrupt word uh, proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And, you know, <clears throat> the Holy Spirit reminds me of this verse a lot. But um, uh, in verses um, uh, 13 uh, through 18, it uh, talks a lot about uh, wisdom. Uh, but I want to look at uh, verse 17 just for a minute. Uh, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, uh, willing to yield, uh, full of mercy and, and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And it's a distinction between sensual wisdom or worldly wisdom, but it's, the, it's describing the wisdom that's from above. It's, it's the heavenly wisdom. It's the wisdom that comes only from God. And the part that I like about that, it's pure. And the word for pure there is the same as word holy. You know, it's, it's like, wow. And then it's peaceable. Um, you know, and it's gentle. It's willing to yield. Uh, uh, in King James, it says, easy to be entreated. In other words, when you hear it, everybody just kind of goes, wow, that was cool, you know? And there's that, that, that commonality, that agreement <coughs> on it. And, um, and full of mercy, because ours is the God of mercy. Uh, good fruit, you know, good results, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Uh, Jesus so often, in his confrontations with uh, the religious uh, leaders of the day, uh, one of the, the, the things he referred to them as most often were hypocrites that they would you know, say one thing and then do something else. And the cool thing about God's word, being God's wisdom is consistent with his word. Uh, God's wisdom will not contradict his word. And so there's no hypocrisy in it. Uh, it's, it's, it's pure, it's good, it's, it's something we can take you know, for ourselves. And so, again, uh, because our God never contradicts himself, he never says one thing and then does something else, uh, he and his word are one. You know, and... Uh, and I, and I love that consistency. Uh, it, now that moves us on now to chapter 4. And uh, <clears throat> chapter 4 kind of lays it on the line a little bit. Uh, we're either going to be a, a servant of God or we're going to be a friend of the world. Uh, and it kind of draws a line there. You're either this or you're that. You know, you're with me or you're against me. And there is no gray area. There's no middle ground. Uh, in verse 1, he says, where do wars and, and, and fights come from among you? Uh, do they not come from your desire for pleasure and, and, and that war in your members? And uh, <clears throat> King James puts it a little more strongly at times, talks about the, you know, the lust. And it's like, whoa, you know, it's uh, worldly stuff. You know, war and strife and lust all over what? <laughs> Stupid things that are going to burn, <laughs> you know, you um, know. A bunch of dumb stuff that, how many of you this last week were under the, the possibility of the threat of evacuation, and at some point you had to go to, through your house and kind of go, I would take this, I wouldn't take that, you know? And, you know, the, the first time we got evacuated, actually, the people helped us. They just cleaned our house out. The second time we got evacuated uh, last year, we took a bunch of stuff but left a bunch of stuff behind. This year when we packed up our stuff, it's like in a duffel bag, and some, some tools in my uh, toolbox in my truck, you know? And it's like, it could all burn, you know? <laughs> That's what insurance is for. And, uh, but you, you start kind of seeing things for what they're, they're really worth. And is any of that stuff really worth, you know, all that much in a sense? It's going to burn. And so we have to have a light touch. Now, you don't take it flippant, be wasteful, whatever. But, you know, sometimes the, the wars, the strife, all these things are very much over dumb things. We've been told, we've been admonished in uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. It says, do not love the world or the things in the world. And if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. 
and the world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. <clears throat> and so it's having a, a, a right heart, a right perspective, a right understanding of things and seeing what, what is really valuable. In verse 2, he, he talks about prayer. He says, you lust and do not have. Murder and covet cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you, you do not have because you do not ask. And kind of a, uh, maybe upbraiding us a little bit for uh, our prayerlessness at times. And I hope I'm not the only one that gets involved in a situation then realizes partway through at some point, oh, I need to pray. Because at first you're reacting, you know, to what you're seeing, you're trying to fix it, doing whatever, and then when it's not going quite right, and it's like, oh, got to pray, you know. And, uh, and he's encouraging us to pray first and, you know, think about it later. You know, to pray first, to make that the first response versus, uh, you know, a secondary or, or last response. But then that brings us to verse 4, <coughs> which I think is a really important verse in this passage, and it says, uh, adulterers and adulteresses, uh, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And so, again, that phrase, adulterers and adulteresses, always kind of caught me uh, until I realized he was talking about me. You know, uh, I've never committed adultery uh, in a practical sense. But have I ever been unfaithful to my Lord? Yes, I have to say I have been. You know, have I, <clears throat> have I, am I guilty of spiritual adultery or spiritual fornication? Have I worshipped some other thing besides the true and living God in my, my, my walk with the Lord? And I have to admit there's been times when I've been very distracted by other things. And, and like he writes to the church in Ephesus, you know, the need to return to my first love. And to repent of you know the way I lived or the way I thought or the way I, I, I viewed things, and there's been times when I've had to do that, and so this verse very much applies to me, um, and anyone else that's been in a, in a similar um, frame of mind. But he says, "Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God?" People kind of forget at times that the Old Testament describes our God as a jealous God. He is jealous for our love. He is jealous for our affection. He is jealous for our attention. And, you know, I can't imagine, I, I try to be very careful, but how would it make my wife feel if I spent a bunch of time with some other woman, whether I took her to coffee or, or chit-chatted around or whatever, at some point, my wife's going to notice, hey, he's talking to her more than he's talking to me, you know? And and, it, and it's kind of like the same thing with God, that he is a jealous God. We're either going to be friends with God and, and, and serve him truly, or the other option. You notice he doesn't list three options or 12. Either you're, as it says here, uh, friendship with the world is enmity with God. And so we've got to choose a side, if you will. And I pray that as we've chosen Jesus, if we've, as we've dedicated our lives to him, as, we, as we've received him as Lord and Savior, that he would help us to live up to that, that he would help us to, to live a life in a way that it's manifest, it's demonstrated that we love Jesus more than anything and everything else. You know, that, that we have a light touch with this world. We're, we're, we're acquainted with this world. We have to operate in this world, but we don't have to be friends with this world, okay? We've got to be devoted to him. So friendship with the world is enmity with God. Paul tells the Romans, in the Romans chapter 8, verses 5, 6, and 7, he said, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded, worldly minded, <clears throat> uh, is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Uh, because the carnal mind is enmity with God or against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. And so we want to be completely yielded to what the Lord wants to do in our lives. And again, <clears throat> as Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, verse 30, uh, he who is not with me is against me. He who does not gather with me scatters abroad. And so Jesus is saying, hey, you're with me or you're against me. There's no other choice. There, there is no middle ground. We're either friends with God or we're enemies with God. 
and friends of the world. Uh, in verses 6 and 7, it says here, he gives more grace, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. <clears throat> I believe that our God uh, is a gracious God. I believe that he's a merciful God. I believe that he's a forgiving God. But, you know, there are times when we prevent some of those things from happening based on our own behavior, our actions, where he can't necessarily sometimes be gracious to us. And, and, he, and he says here, uh, point blank, uh, God resists the proud. I, I've been involved with people and, and at times, and I've heard that question asked, you know, where's the, where's the grace in that? And I go, I'm not sure. I don't know. You know, uh, if that person's being proud and rebellious and all that kind of stuff, there shouldn't necessarily be an expectation of grace, <laughs> maybe of fearful judgment or whatever, but, you know, uh, because God resists the proud. In fact, uh, we hear it from three sources. This, to me, this is interesting. We're, we're reading it here uh, as James is saying, you know, God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. But we read in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34, essentially the same thing. He says, Surely he scorns the scornful, but he gives grace to the humble. And then later on, the Apostle Peter. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, he says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And so three different sources kind of describing the same thing. We should not presume upon the grace of God. We, we can't demand it. We, you know, I expect it to a certain degree because I know our God's a gracious God, but not when I'm in uh, willful sin or being rebellious. Uh, in verse 8, he says, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. <clears throat> and first thing I want to point out about that is draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Uh, not that he might or could, but if we make it the attempt to draw near to God, and I've seen a lot of people over the years that for different reasons have drifted away from the Lord or begin to live a different life, all that kind of stuff. And at some point they kind of come to their senses like the prodigal son and and they make that attempt to draw near to God. They go, you know what? i got to get right with God. I need to repent of my sin or whatever. And they turn around and go, I'm going to start going back to church. I'm going to start reading my Bible. And anyone that I've ever seen do that, I've seen God meet them where they're at. And I've seen God do miraculous things in people's lives simply for being willing to say, Lord, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a wretch. I'm a sinner, but Lord, here I am. And he says, I, I, and he wraps his arms around us and he receives us. And so it is so true. That if he'll draw near to God, he'll draw near to us. And he is the God who not only meets us where we're at, but if we seek just in our own hearts to draw near to him even a little bit, he will draw near to us. That's why Jesus declared in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. He's always beckoning us to himself and, I believe, to a closer walk. He desires that loving personal relationship with us, and so he draws us by his spirit to himself. The Old Testament prophet Jeremiah tells us in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 23, Am I a God near at hand, says the Lord, and not a God afar off? You know, he, he's declaring that he's close to his people. Um, in this verse also, he says, draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. So he tells us what to do. Then the last half of the verse, he tells us how to do it. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Purify your heart. Get rid of the junk that distracts you from me, that you would have a, a single heart, a, a, a complete heart, a, a heart given completely over to Jesus, like we talked about earlier, about not being double-minded or you know, half-hearted. <clears throat> he says, purify your heart. Get rid of the stuff that's not pure. And um, you know, for me, this is a, an interesting uh, verse because God is the one that cleans us. I can't clean myself up. And so he, he, Jesus died on the cross to, to pay the price for my sins that I couldn't pay for myself. So Jesus does that purifying work. That's where we are in a positional sense with our Lord. But on a practical sense, this implies that I bear some responsibility in my actions, my attitude, my lifestyle, whatever, where I'm supposed to try to do, in a sense, the right thing or to not do things that would, you know, uh, pollute or uh, defile uh, our lives, our hearts. And so you know, I don't have to give you a laundry list of stuff. You know, hey, there's some things out in the world you should probably avoid. You know, uh, secular this or that or, you know, you, the, the, the extreme stuff is easy. You know, talk about uh, pornography or sexual immorality. That's a given. 
But I think there's other things out there that we should prayerfully consider. Should that be part of our lives or not? You know, and seek to do what we can to live as much as we can a, a pure life before the Lord. Peter tells us in uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15, But as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. You know, we're, we're trying to have our hearts and our minds, our thoughts, brought into conformity with our Lord Jesus, that we want to be more like him. We want to say the things that he says. You know, we want to have the attitude that he's got. You know, we want to love people the way he loves people. And so uh, for that to happen, uh, one of us is going to have to change. I don't think it's going to be the Lord, <laughs> you know. And so, Lord, do that work in me. That brings us now to chapter 5. <clears throat> and chapter 5 talks a little bit about uh, the latter rain, the, the, the former rain, the latter rain, and prayer. And uh, looking at the first few verses, uh, it, it says, Come now, you rich, uh, weep and howl for your miseries that, that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted, your garments are moth-eaten, uh, your gold and silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be a, a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. Uh, you've, been, you've heaped up treasure in the last days and kind of goes on. But I think James is addressing those that, uh, given the uncertainty of their times, uh, the persecution that they're experiencing, uh, people were probably uh, tempted to protect themselves, probably hoarding you know, their money, their silver, their gold, or whatever, holding it in reserve. And, uh, and he's kind of describing this as a wasted effort. Uh, this, in a sense, addresses those who are trusting in their riches, not in the Lord. Uh, the weeping and howling is part of what will come upon those who've uh, condemned themselves to hell, rejecting the Lord. Uh, and sometimes because, you know, they value their riches more than a relationship with the true and the living God. Uh, verses uh, 7 and 8, <clears throat> basically it's describing being ready for the Lord when he comes back. Uh, Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and the latter rain. Uh, you also be patient and establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Uh, but it's kind of cool. <coughs> First off, he says, you know, uh, be patient as we wait. And uh, one of my favorite verses lately has been uh, Isaiah 49, verse 23. Uh, they shall not be ashamed who wait for me. Those that wait on the Lord will not be ashamed. It's not kind of paraphrasing it. Um, but uh, speaking of the early rain versus the, the, the latter rain, uh, the early rain refers to the first outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the church there after Christ's ascension into heaven, uh, speaking of Pentecost and all that. And the latter rain is the final outpouring of the Holy Spirit before the harvest is reaped. And I think we're experiencing that now. I think we're very close to that if we're not actually experiencing it. And so the latter rain. Um, verses 10 and 11. Uh, My brethren, take the prophets who, who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. And so the prophets are our examples. Then in uh, verse 14, we're exhorted to pray. Actually, 14, 15, and 16 are all about prayer. If anyone among you is sick, let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, he'll be forgiven. Uh, verse 16, confess your trespasses to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. Then it ends with the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And so an exhortation to prayer, an exhortation understanding that you will be heard. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man. And it's not the, the, the figure that you might be thinking of. It's you. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're made righteous by the blood of the Lamb, then you are that righteous man whose prayer God hears. And I love that. I love knowing that I'm not just praying to the ceiling, you know, that uh, God hears when we pray. And so the exhortation uh, to prayer. Then the last couple of verses here, verses uh, 19 and 20. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. And so to me, it, it's an exhortation. There, there are going to be people around us at times that either stray from the faith or fall away from the faith or you know, turn away from it intentionally, whatever. 
And it's an exhortation that we should go after them, that we are our brother's keeper. Now, I've done that with many individuals, and some have turned back. Some have just said, pound sand and go away, you know, and they want they want to listen to you. and But not for my lack of trying, you know, not for my desire to, to see them, you know, in a right relationship with God. And so there's the exhortation to restore those that you can. And, uh, and when it talks about those that wander away uh, from the faith, in a sense, they knew the truth, uh, but they've wandered away. And, you know, Paul exhorts us in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, he says, um, Brethren, if any man is overtaken in a trespass, uh, you who are spiritual, restore such to one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. And so, not to think that we're, you know, any better than they are, because we're not. Uh, we're all sinners saved by grace. But when you see somebody and you approach them, not in an arrogant way, but in humility, trying to draw them back. And, um, and you know, as it says here, uh, if, that, if we're successful, then we cover a multitude of sins. Um, their sins, and, you know, maybe in some respect ours. Anyway, so that's an overview of uh, the book of James, <clears throat> all five chapters. But as I was finishing up my study in this, um, I was reading uh, Warren Wiersbe's uh, commentary uh, on the book in general. And at the end of uh, the study that he presented, uh, he offered up uh, some questions that we might ask ourselves as a result of having studied through and read through this book. Uh, again, uh, the, the overall theme of this book is spiritual maturity. Uh, it is uh, the idea that we would uh, uh, grow stronger as we walk longer, you know, with the Lord, uh, and uh, uh, to get serious about our faith. And so he asks uh, 12 questions, and I modified a couple of them just because they were kind of a little different to me, but um, I want to ask you these 12 questions. These are just for your own introspection, uh, kind of a way of assessing how much of this book we have or have not, you know, absorbed. And the first question he poses is, uh, am I counting at all joy when I'm challenged with a trial? You know, am I, am I counting at all joy or am I, am I any more patient now than I was, say, 10 years ago <laughs> or 10 weeks ago? Uh, second question uh, do I play with temptation or resist it from the start? You know, uh, my struggle with that is usually at uh, IGA in front of the donut case. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But, you know, do we play with temptation or do we just, you know, you know turn away from it? Uh, do we deal with it in a biblical way? Um, because if we, if we resist the devil, he'll flee from us. Uh, it resist the devil's food donut. Anyway, uh, do I find joy in obeying the word of God? doing God's word, or do I merely study and learn it in an intellectual sense? And so are we seeking to apply it to our lives? Uh, the first chapter talked about, um, you know, partiality or, or favoritism. And he asked the question, are there any prejudices uh, that shackle me? And, you know, it sounds kind of weird in our, in our woke culture and all that kind of stuff. Um, but do we have any uh, issues with partiality, you know, favoritism? Uh, maybe examine that. Am I able to control my tongue? And you go, well, <laughs> can I give you a percentage? Uh, <clears throat> am I a peacemaker rather than a troublemaker? Uh, some people just love stirring the pot and then, you know, then leave the room <laughs> and then stand by the door and listen. <laughs> you know, am I a troublemaker or do people come to me for a spiritual wisdom? Uh, here's a good one, number seven. Uh, am I a friend of God? or a friend of the world. You know, and I'm not sure if you want to put that on a scale and see where it goes, but uh, <clears throat> good question. Um, do I make plans without considering the will of God? Remember, in uh, if the Lord's willing, we'll do this or we'll do that. So is God part of that equation when we consider what we're going to do? Uh, am I selfish when it comes to money? Uh, am I faithful or unfaithful in the paying of my bills? Um we don't talk about it a lot, but I'm, uh, I'm going to start a, as we go through the Fundamentals of Faith on Sunday, we're going to do a 12-part series on tithing. Not, we're not. 12-part, <laughs> two-year study on, anyway. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, do I naturally depend on prayer when I find myself in some kind of trouble? You know, how, how, how quick or how prone are we to, you know, praying? Uh, about things. 
Um, am I the kind of person others seek to uh, for, for prayer support? And then uh, last question here is, uh, what is my attitude towards the wandering brother? You know, do I criticize and gossip or do I seek to, to restore him, you know, in love? And so I, I've seen people fall and I thought, oh, no, Lord, you know, and I, I've seen people I can't talk to or can't touch and I pray for them. Uh, you, sometimes you can kind of see it coming, you know, like a train down the tracks. You know, it's like, oh, man, there's going to be a train wreck when it gets there. Uh, there's other times, and it's not picking them apart. It's just that you can see some things like that. Um, but our attitude, you know, are we glad when people stumble and fall? Finally, you know, <laughs> you know, um, how do we approach that? And so what's my attitude towards those uh, that have stumbled? But uh, the last comment I'll make is uh, just grow, don't just grow old, grow up, you know, uh, help us to want to mature as a Christian and to be doers of the word and understand who we're pleasing. You're not seeking to please me as a pastor. You're not seeking to please people around us, the church or anything like that. We're, we, we, we perform, if you will, for an audience of one. Okay. Our desire is simply to please him. Because he's the one that will rest his hand on your shoulder perfectly one day and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. That's what we want to hear. Father God, we thank you for this evening. Uh, we thank you for your love. We thank you for the exhortation. Lord, we thank you for uh, the whooping at times. Lord, we, we, we thank you for uh, your interest in our lives and that you, you chasten us, you teach us, you guide us, uh, you, you instruct us in your ways. And thank you for paying attention to us, Lord. Thank you for, for counting us worthy uh, for your attention. And so help us to be doers of your word, not hearers only. Help us to please you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if you're able, let's uh, stand together and worship. <clears throat> His mercy is more Stronger than darkness New every morn Our sins, they are many His mercy is more What love could remember No wrongs we have done um, I'm knowing he counts not their son. Don't into a sea without bottom more sure. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Out. Praise the Lord. 
His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for your instruction. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. Lord, we thank you for your love and your kindness. And Father, as we seek to be doers of your word, help us, Lord, to do it for the right reason. Help us to to do it, Lord, because we love you and we want so much to please you. And would you guide us, Lord, in the proper outcome? Give us the right motivation in our hearts. And Lord, lead us to the right outcome practically. All, Lord, that you and you alone would truly be glorified. Thank you, Father, for your goodness to us. We praise your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless thee. The Lord bless thee. And keep thee. And keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee. And be gracious unto thee, and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up, the Lord lift up his, countenance his countenance upon thee, and give thee peace. Well, God bless you guys. I pray that you're encouraged. I pray that you're challenged a little bit. Uh, I pray that our Lord will continue to speak to your hearts about all these things and that in the end of it, uh, his joy will manifest in your countenance. God bless you guys. Have a great night. If you need prayer for any reason, come on up. We'd love to pray with you.